Uh, hi everyone, nice to meet you. I haven't yet met you all, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm glad that you're here and hopefully you will like this presentation that I've prepared for you all. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Slavcho or Slavko or Slav, however you, it's easier for you. Um, uh, I joined uh, SoftServe uh, recently. Actually, uh, let me just go to a moment. For some reason, I cannot switch in a second. It doesn't allow me to. Okay, okay, it's working now. So yeah, uh, so basically, the agenda for today is uh, is uh, kind of short and easy. Um, I usually like um, um, examples. I think it's they are, uh, they provide a, an easier learning experience, like in presentations. So I like presentations with examples. So uh, I would say the um, yeah the the main talk here is uh, around actual examples. Uh, but yeah, we um, will speak a, a bit about why concurrency is hard. Uh, we'll go through several examples. We'll try to build up a list of things to try and follow and um, when working with concurrency in Go. And uh, yeah, it's not gonna be a comprehensive list of uh, examples. It's not gonna be a comprehensive list of things to do of rules, but hopefully um, by the end, you will uh, have learned something new or at least uh, it would have uh, uh, served as a refresher for, uh, for you. Uh, for everyone who's familiar with the things I'm, that I'm gonna be speaking about. So yeah, um, uh, why uh, concurrency is hard, first of all. Um, so you're all Go, Go developers. I would assume that you like, I mean, the Go concurrency model, or maybe you're not using it that much because I uh, people that I've um, talked to sometimes don't actually use uh, concurrency that often because they don't have a use case for it or it doesn't make sense or they are just junior and don't have experience yet or whatever reason. But uh, before we speak about and go through the examples, uh, let's yeah let's just say why is it hard? Well, I guess it's it's pretty simple when you actually think about it. Uh, but uh, the the bugs are uh, that we get with concurrency, which we all do. I mean, I even introduce, uh, I have introduced some in the past uh, uh, by myself. Um, so the, the problem is that we have um, an additional level of complexity that um, uh, gets added by concurrency in general. I mean, the, the easiest way to think about programming, I think, um, is the sequential iterative approach whereby you have sequential code. Everything is easily digestible. When you read it, you can understand what's happening, but when you um, introduce another uh, an, another um, level, like let's say like a memory management, like in C, I mean, when you have memory management, you this is another level of complexity that just you need to be aware of, you need to handle it. And similarly, concurrency is such a, a additional layer. And what it introduces, of course, is because you have multiple uh, go routines or threads uh, of execution, you um, you uh, get race conditions, of course, and race conditions are non-deterministic, which means that, of course, uh, you will get different results each time, um, and uh, and that's hard to debug. It's hard to work with sometimes, uh, and of course there are synchronization primitives. You know the usual ones, like the the ones in the sync package, like mutexes, um, but um, which help you synchronize and basically take care of the uh, of the of the concurrency problems, but then uh, they introduce another problem, which are blocking issues, right? And we need to deal with those, but they introduce a completely new um, uh, set of issues. So, having said that, I mean we all think and I think we all agree that Go solves some of these problems, but I don't think it really solves them completely, right? I mean, uh, how many of you have actually had issues with ghost concurrence, even though I think we all believe in it. I assume that every one of you has had issues in production, like having production code, breaking sometimes, somehow having weird behavior. And then, I mean, it just feels that 
everything's fine, but it's not. I mean, you you need to deal with that somehow. Uh, and I think the way to deal with it, of course, is to identify um, uh, the actual problems. And uh, there was a study uh, that was done. I'm not sure if you've read this. There was a study done by several people uh, from two, uni uh, two universities, the Pennsylvania State University and Purdue University. Uh, these people, I'm not going to try and pronounce their names because I'm going to butcher them surely. Uh, but they've made a quite an interesting study where they uh, whereby they picked up some very high profile and popular languages with a lot of uh, uh, with big communities and so on and so on and a lot of senior developers with, who know i mean you would assume of course that they know what they're doing but the problem is that they still found a lot of issues a lot of concurrency bugs and what they did actually for this study is um, uh, <clears throat> looking to the git history of the projects uh, like Docker, Kubernetes, etc. The uh, uh, Cockroach DB. These are, uh, as you as you know, quite big projects. They looked into the uh, into the Git history of these projects and searched for commits, which had to do something. The message had to do with fixing a bug with concurrency. So they probably didn't found, find every concurrency bug out there in those projects, but they still found quite a lot. Uh, and they compiled this list of bugs and tried to. Uh, provide some taxonomy, some the categorization, and they figured they found out that there are uh, basically two types, two main categories of bugs: uh, blocking versus non-blocking bugs. And then the other categorization is uh, when uh, in bugs which use shared memory, which is the sync package, you know, mutexes, and then message passing. And now message passing is exactly the thing that go. Uh, the, um, provides with Go routines, right? Because as you know, Go uses CSP, uh, communicate communicating sequential processes by Tony Huar, uh, and um, which is not a completely novel idea. Like it's from the seventies when actually most computer science papers were written and are just being rediscovered nowadays. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you would assume, I guess, that message passing. And this CSP approach uh, uh, solves a lot of the issues, right? Well, not exactly, at least according to this study. And uh, there, there doesn't seem to be another study done on this topic so far. Um, it seems like uh, message passing, as you can see, still uh, occupies a lot of the, you know, a lot of, um, uh, of the total number of issues. And also something other that is interesting is that people in the Go community still use the sync package quite a lot. I mean, it's not like they're trying to use those lock-free uh, methodologies like uh, uh, patterns and stuff like that. So, so yeah, and um, that's quite interesting, I think. Uh, so now we're gonna just go through some examples. Some of them are non-blocking, some of them are blocking. And uh, as I said in the beginning, it's, uh, it's not comprehensively, some of these are really simple examples, which uh, probably some of you are already familiar with, but uh, here goes nothing. So this is one of the like, uh, probably most familiar, uh, most popular examples, but uh, I think it's it's still uh, it's still okay to go through it. So um, as you can see, we have this um, simple um, main function, uh, which has a for loop. It executes uh, uh, a function, uh, a go routine, for each iteration in the loop, and it just prints uh, the counter, basically. And as you know, probably, I'm not sure, is there anyone unfamiliar with this example? I would guess not, but if, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, basically what it does is it, it would usually print 10, 10, 10, like uh, 10 times it would print 10, or maybe it would print nine or eight a couple of times and then 10 again. And now the, what, what is the actual issue here the, uh, in detail? The issue is that this thing here is uh, executes in this Go routine, which is the main Go routine. Because as you know, everything runs in a Go routine in Go. So the main Go routine is still like the main thread, so to speak, uh, still executes in this uh, main Go routine. And it executes, it executes top down, right? So each time we go through this code block, uh, let me erase. Each each time we go through this code block, 
we execute this uh, um, Go routine, which will actually be scheduled by the scheduler. And then uh, it will print I, but it will print I um, as it's uh, defined in this outer scope, right? And because the Go scheduler might, might schedule these Go routines to run after this for loop has executed, we will get this result, right? And what is the fix for this? Uh, well, there are two uh, two possible solutions actually. One of them is to just pass uh, uh, i like to the as an argument to the function, and then we would have the original value of i when it was actually executed because it won't be bound to the outer scope. Because in the previous example, i was bound to the outer scope, but now. Of course, this would be bound to this scope. And, and this is the other solution, which is to reassign i. But when I say reassign, we actually allocate a new variable, which is in this block. Because as you know, uh, Go has um, uh, supports closures, but it, it, has, it, it still has block scope. So this block will have a different scope, right? So recreating i, reallocating i will have a, a separate variable, this would be different than this one. And uh, by the time the Go routine executes, it will be bound to the one in this block. And this will fix the problem, basically, right? Um, OK, and let's go to the next one. The next one is also a fairly simple one, which is uh, which has to do with uh, uh, weight groups and misuse of weight groups, basically. Uh, this is easy to spot, I guess. But uh, when, you, when you're doing a code review, I think it's not that easy to spot. I mean, probably. Uh, and uh, by the way, some of these examples, as I said, are found in pretty serious projects. So, so yeah. Um, so uh, the weight group gets um, uh, weighted on in this for loop. As, as you can imagine, I mean, it's going to basically, um, it's going to block on the first iteration even. So yeah, this is quite easy to, to fix. Of course, you just need to make sure that uh, you wait outside of the for loop. And yeah, that's pretty much the solution for it. Uh, okay, when I, uh, it's hard for me to move. Yeah, I need to uh, stop drawing. Okay, so another, solu uh, another problem with uh, uh, weight group misuse is uh, when you are adding tasks to the counter because as you know weight groups have a counter um, and uh, underneath so you usually specify how many tasks you can specify as in the previous example you can specify how many tasks you want to execute but sometimes there are there are cases uh, where people um, call uh, weight group add and basically increment the counter in a for loop now, the problem here is uh, that um, this example will uh, provide us with a with the wrong answer, basically. The count will be um, uh, maybe one or seven of 28 because we're calling add in a Go routine. And since we're adding, uh, since we're calling it in the, in the Go routine, that it is quite possible that this weight will uh, uh, wait for the counter to get to zero before some of the Go routines that get executed here actually increment the count. So wait will happen before we add another, you know, the, before we increment the counter basically, uh, add another task to the group. So uh, we will, yeah, we will stop waiting before everything has done, has been done. And of course the, the solution for this is quite simple. And by the way, when I say uh, quite simple, yeah, it's just moving a line. Now, uh, something in that study, uh, which is uh, worth mentioning, is uh, that the people doing the study said um, that most of the time, issues like this, these were really easy to, um, to fix, like in one or two lines of code even. So certainly Go provides us with, the, with a lot of functionality, with a lot of uh, new primitives, which make our lives easier to some degree, but still these types of things happen. Yeah, uh, and yeah, as you as you can see, the solution here is just move this to here, and oops, and that's it. 
so yeah um what are the takeaways i think from from this really simple uh, these two very simple examples well i'm not sure for you but uh, um i've seen code bases where people don't write tests and this is like uh, a weird one to still bring up uh having in mind we have like um uncle bob and, uh, and the tdd community and the um but the, the point is that people still don't write tests as much as they can uh, as, as much as they should uh sometimes as you know because of uh, other reasons maybe lack of time but it i think it's extremely important for uh for us to write tests especially for concurrent issues uh if you can isolate your concurrent code test it very, very thoroughly because one of the biggest problems and i uh, forgot to specify this uh i guess um, in the um, uh, in my first slide, but uh, one of the reasons for concurrency being hard, I guess, is uh, because uh, this non-determinism, because you might have a bug and it will lay there, will stay there and not uh, uh, manifest itself, maybe for months or even a year, and then you would be chasing ghosts. Because usually when you have a bug in production, something weird happening, you will, you would go and see, okay, what did we change like in in the past hour or in the past day or something like that but when you have these types of issues they're actually very hard to debug very hard to find so i think testing from the ground up like from the start is uh, very important okay so moving on to something a bit more interesting uh, so this example uh, shows uh, is an example of a memory leak and it's quite simple. We have uh, a list of tasks, which are, as you can see, just some strings. We have a channel. And then at this point, I mean, uh, uh, in my um, when I was uh, writing the examples locally for st still testing them, I was, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, as, you, as you know, from uh, the runtime provides you with the ability to actually get how many go routines, active go routines you have at a certain point. So uh, yeah, you, we would have just one go routine here, right? Which is the main one. The main goal thing then we arrange we arrange over the tasks and we just uh, uh, execute one go routine we schedule one go routine with a certain task and uh yeah it's it should be a very simple one let's say i mean i i, I haven't written here the the worker example but it does something it basically um um rise to the channel uh, right and then uh we can get the first one to respond by um by just uh, getting the uh, um the first uh, the first item in the channel just uh, reading from the channel getting the first result but then if we like if we sleep for three seconds or whatever and then we uh, uh, get again with the runtime uh, the number of active go routines we would get five go routines there which is basically uh we had five examples the the main one so six but minus the one that we uh got from the channel so we have five the main plus four worker go routines which are stuck forever right and of course the a solution for this a good solution for this i think is to just uh if you if you have a uh, if, if you have the number of tasks that you want to execute it's always good uh to make sure that you know when each one of them um uh ended like when they stopped uh, their work so you need to have a wait group for all of them make sure that you wait for all of them and then close the channel and of course uh it's a good idea to drain the channel i mean if if they actually um uh, uh, when the um which will make sure that uh, the, there is nothing in the channel basically this way we have one go routine at the end and we'll fix the it will fix the memory leak okay so another memory leak example is uh this one uh by the way are there any questions so far or anything like that okay i'm taking this four second uh pause uh like silence for no uh, so another <clears throat> example which is a bit harder to spot and actually it happens in uh, Sorry, something is, you can use buffer channel. Um, yeah, you can use a uh, buffer channel, uh, 
absolutely yeah you can uh, this is another way i agree uh <clears throat> so uh but yeah I, I guess i provided this example because um i mean this is a very simple one but uh, i've had cases whereby you exactly this type of case whereby we, um i would need to execute multiple go routines for them to do something then get the first responder but then do something with all of the results so i guess that's i, I didn't point this out but uh um i guess in my head this was what i was thinking of this example from my experience for getting all the results and then sending them to kafka let's say um okay so another example is this time after misuse uh whereby we have um a message messages channel we have uh, a go routine which goes through like um, 100 iterations and uh and basically prints the Prints the memory usage. I mean, this this actually um, when I was testing locally, this was just to make sure that I can actually see the memory usage um, of the of the program. Uh, and this is all it does basically. It just every second it just prints the memory usage of the runtime. Um, and then in another Go routine, we have like ten million records, and we just send. And of course, these are all simple examples. So this just sends immediately the uh, the integer like in string form uh, and yeah uh, and then we have the long running function which uh, it uh, which uh, uh, uses a for loop uh, and it selects uh, so it it basically gets all the messages right but after uh, uh, it, it has a time after uh, so after a minute it would still like stop it will return uh, the problem here is that uh, if you have a lot of um, uh, a lot of data and you have a lot of these iterations, you may not see it, but here actually you are allocating a new <clears throat> uh, you are creating a new go routine because time after will still have a um, uh, uh, it will have a channel uh, and it will be allocated. So for a short period of time, I mean, this will get garbage collected after some time, but for some time you would like increase your memory usage like tremendously, like from several uh, megabytes to like uh, 700 megabytes or something like that. Like it's, in, it's insane. So the, the fix would be to use a timer to make sure that uh, you don't allocate new, uh, new memory. And uh, yeah, you reset the timer, you, uh, yeah, the the point here is that um, what I'm trying to make is that with time after is um, is not something in the sync package. It's not something particularly. Uh, I mean, it doesn't scream Go routines when you see it, right? It, but it is. I mean, a lot of the functionality in Go of the standard library actually uses Go routines or uh, channels under the hood. Uh, so you need to be aware of that because otherwise you may hit into problems. Uh, okay, so another problem um, is um, the non-determinism of select. You've probably hit something like that before. Uh, most of you should be aware of that. Uh, so the problem is that, as you know, select is not deterministic when uh, it's listening on several sources. So here we have um, a, a Go function, no, sorry, a, a, a Go routine executed. And after three seconds, let's say we just write to the stop channel. But then we also um, uh, have this run function, which uh, when we execute it, uh, by the way, some of these examples are written in this way so that I can fit them on two slides. So they're not the best thing to follow, but uh, that's what you can do with, uh, with that much space, I guess. So, um, yeah, so we have this um, uh, ticker, which uh, has the duration that we pass, which is, let's say, one second. And for each second, we may uh, uh, be listening for the stop channel and the ticker, right? And there is uh, a 50% chance, basically, of which one will hit. And the non-determinism basically comes from uh, the fact that we don't know. I mean, the, the way Go uh, selects um, the, um, uh, the source is, is exactly, it's random. And the reason it's it's done this way is so that you can avoid starvation when there is one specific source that may be more greedy and might have more um, 
might pro uh, might produce more, right? Uh, so one of the solutions, I guess, which is again not, uh, I, I mean, I don't think it's exactly, it's still not deterministic, but you um, increase the chances of actually hitting the stop channel earlier. So uh, yeah, just be aware of this. It's, uh, it's a good one to have in mind. So uh, some takeaways. I'm not sure if you've used this thing. Uh, it might help you with uh, go leaks. It's um, uh, with um, go routine leaks. Uh, it's a it's a tool provided by uh, Uber. So yeah, you basically just uh, uh, install. I mean, you uh, include it uh, in your uh, project and you call it in your tests, and uh, it might help you in some cases. Uh, okay, so another example, but with. Um, synchronization with the sync package. So we have here a very simple example with two go routines being executed. And then we select, which of course, as you know, blocks. So they're gonna keep execute. Uh, yeah, they're gonna be executing. We're gonna block the main routine. So we have three uh, go routines. This stays by block. I mean, we would need to hit control and C to actually close the program, right? And we have two locks. And uh, this is a very you know, uh, uh, like basic example, uh, which probably most of you are again familiar with. And this is not a, an issue usually with Go. This is like with every language which supports synchronization primitives, uh, locks, uh, these mutexes. So let's say you uh, one of the Go routine, and uh, it, as you can see, these uh, go th through a loop. Uh, the reason for this is because this increases the possibility of actually hitting the, the deadlock. But um, what happens is that, uh, let's say you have two resources and you have two go routines and these go routines are working with these resources, but then you just, like, it's a very simple mistake, but you still get the order of the locks wrong. This is gonna, this is gonna introduce a deadlock. So what you need to do is, of course, just try and make sure that the order of the locks is correct and this will usually just solve your problem uh it's easy to miss and again a lot of the examples in those big projects have this type of issue it's easy to spot here it's not as easy to spot when uh, you have like multiple functions uh defined in different places uh doing this uh yeah uh, hopefully, we will have more static analysis tools. I think the, as you know, the um, the Go um, ecosystem usually grows and it's quite good and with the SA package. And uh, um, I think it's gonna be become easier uh, when people write more uh, type of linter static check uh, analysis static analysis checkers uh, to actually find this. But these are still hard things to find. Um, Another thing you um, you need to avoid doing, of course, is even if you even if you have the uh, the order correct from the start, it you can just have one additional lock somewhere by mistake, and you will still get the deadlock because um, you're basically incrementing like the counter again of the mutex. I mean, so it, it's still gonna be in lock state. So yeah, this is another example of having that same issue. Okay, so here's another deadlock example, uh, but not with um, the sync package, but with go routines. Uh, and again, I'm as I'm showing this, I'm going back to the to the study. We're we still have blocking issues, even though we have message passing. There are still blocking issues because when you have um, uh, unbuffered channels or even buffer channels, don't fix it because as you know, buffer channels are just uh, they are like an um, uh, I mean, um, they pro they still uh, work as an unbuffered channel when you when you get to the point uh, uh, when you um, uh, use all of the items in the buffer, right? And so you would still block if you have too many senders and too uh, fewer receivers. So um, this example is a bit more convoluted. So let me explain here. Uh, uh, you've probably seen this um, pattern whereby uh, you have some limit. So we have a, a an unbuffered channel. With, uh, let me go through 
the start here. So we have a, uh, a weight group. We have a list of um, items, some collection, and then we make sure that we iterate, uh, well, that we, we have a weight group with the number of, um, uh, of items, right? So we want to make sure that we're gonna wait here and then close the found channel, which is here. So we uh, are trying to find the even, uh, and again, this is not the best way to find the even, uh, this is just for the uh, uh, sake of the argument. We're trying to find the even, um, um, yeah, um, the even um, numbers in this, in this list, in this range. So basically the find function uh, will uh, go in a loop. It will uh, run a, uh, a go routine. It will check whether this is even, and then it will send it to the found uh, channel. And here we iterate over the found channel and we return the results. So uh, the API of this function, let's say, is synchronous, but internally we do something asynchronously, right, uh, concurrently, which is quite normal and uh, maybe something that you desire in some cases. And we have a limit channel, which is a buffer channel, uh, which is used here to uh, to basically limit the the number of go routines that are being executed at any particular point in time. So uh, we may have like uh, uh, 10 or 100 or uh, however, um, uh, some very big range, but we will make sure, we are making sure that when we are running the find function, it will use at most for, uh, let, let's say actually 10 in our case, 10 go routines at any point in time. Now, what is the problem with this though? Can, you, can anyone spoil it? I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a bigger example, but uh, okay, I'm taking, I'm taking your silence for no, at least maybe you need more time. But the problem here is that, uh, uh, and it's harder to spot, that we, if we have like a, a bigger, um, a bigger number here, like a hundred, uh, we will deadlock because, um, uh, the limit here, uh, I mean, the, uh, this go routine is trying to, to, uh, to send to limit, right? Limit is a buffer channel. So it has 10 items in the buffer that we can write to. Um, so it will, it will write, it will fill up the buffer though. And at the end it will, um, uh, and by the way, this is, um, this thing here, again, this is uh, like coming back to the, pre, uh, to one of the first examples. Since this is in a go routine, uh, this is gonna block, this is gonna block at some point when we fill in. So we won't be calling go, uh, this go routine here, when when the limit channel gets blocked, when we have, uh, when we fill up the limit, which is 10. And let's say, uh, let's say we have a hundred or a thousand, uh, you know, uh, items in the range, and then on the tenth one, we will block. We will just wait here. Yeah. So we will not be sending to found. Uh, and the problem here, though, is that uh, uh, because we are blocking, uh, we will block here. So we will never get to actually uh, range over found. If that makes sense, right? So we will be blocking here. We will never get to found to. Uh, Basically, uh, decreasing the number in that uh, in that um, uh, uh, limit channel. So uh, this thing here, which is uh, um, give me a second, uh, two, two, two. yeah, here uh, the limit uh, each go routine releases uh, the uh, the token, so to speak, to the to the buffer channel. So it usually should like decrease the buffer again, so that someone else can take some other go routine can take a place, like get the token so that it can, it can do its work. The problem is that this will never happen. What I'm trying to, pro uh, to prove here is that this code may look perfectly fine at first and still might cause issues. And it might cause issues when the input changes. So that's a hard thing to spot, like, so yeah. Uh, and the solution here, sorry, the, the solution here is quite simple, actually. In this case, you just need to make sure that you call 
find with in, inside the goroutine so it won't block because this is where the blocking happened right so again we have message passing everything but with the synchronization we still hit a blocking issue okay so <clears throat> another example with uh, a blocking sender um this was uh, this is uh, uh, a fairly a, a lot more easier to to uh, understand i think uh, so we uh, find we have this finish request function which basically acts as a wrapper around the function we're not passing the function let's say it's in the same scope in the same package we are calling it we're getting the results and we're writing to the channel so uh this way let's say we are uh, we're achieving basically to uh, to either get this thing uh, immediately if the find function is too is fast or get some default value if, if if it's not that fast after a certain duration when we time out now the problem here is what happens when we uh when find is too slow does anyone know actually it's written here yeah it blocks forever because uh let's say timeout happens we return and then there is no one i mean this um um we are writing to to channel but there is no one here to actually read from it this is no longer uh this no longer exists it's not there so the solution here is actually to just have a buffer channel whereby this won't block and we will continue and we can close it or even we can we, can, we may even skip closing it it should be garbage collected uh sorry i don't case one never happened uh, sorry, Igor, I'm not sure uh, you wrote uh, something a while back, I guess, and I'm not sure which example. Uh, don't uh, um, don't be shy to interrupt me at any point in time because I'm, I'm not seeing the chat messages all the time. Do you want me to go back to the example you were referring to? Case one never happened. Hello? Uh, okay i guess we can leave this for after the talk um so more takeaways um i think uh, a very important one uh, which you're probably following still but uh, um it it's still probably worth mentioning is use the race detector it won't catch all the problems uh, you might have but it will catch some of them um okay so double close on the channel this is uh uh, of course, you know that you, uh, you shouldn't uh, call close on a channel, but there are cases whereby uh, you might still do that. I mean, you might still have, um, um, at, at least there was such a case in the, um, uh, in the study, in one of the projects. Uh, of course, I haven't, uh, I haven't moved the, the actual example because it was quite big, so I'm trying to make it simpler. But the point is that it was there were there was a case whereby you would try to close um, something twice, and let's say this is a like a copier, so uh, a copier which streams like handles some streaming operation, uh, and somehow you get closed, which is a method on the copier called somewhere. So if it's usually this is like um, a solution you can you can find over the internet, like people suggested uh, to. To check whether the 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 channel the closed channel is already uh, closed the channel in the computer or the default would be to close it now the problem is that this again won't uh, i mean it might work sometimes it might work, not work uh, every time so it's not safe uh, and a safer way if you ever get to that so, uh, if you ever uh, get to this point where you might call close a couple of times use the sync once primitive which will i mean internally use a, a, a mutex but it will make sure that it will call call this function only once so close will be called only once um yeah so having said that uh i still think it a takeaway is to not to make sure you never send uh, you know uh, uh, a close message never close uh, a channel twice if you do use the sync uh and yeah and usually uh, this is like uh, 
uh, good advice. Um, don't try to send to close a channel if, if it has multiple senders. Unless, of course, you know they've all finished, if they were in a weight group, something that you control. Otherwise, don't close it. Um, okay, um, I'm actually probably a bit slower uh, with presenting. We have several more, more slides and we'll be done. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, this is again, uh, I, I would assume, somewhat si uh, simple for you, for all of you. But uh, um, as you might found like reading, writing Go code, uh, most people, um, uh, when you need to like use a resource like a map, as you know, a map, the, the map um, um, uh, in Go routine, uh, in, in Go is not, um, not thread safe by default, um, but uh, so is uh, the, the same goes for the slices. Uh, slices are also not um, um, thread safe. Um, and you need to provide uh, um, thread safe functional. I mean, you need to basically make sure that they are um, accessed in a thread safe manner. Uh, this is actually an example that I recently found out while, while I was reading the clan's code um, uh, and trying to understand something. I actually found a bug like this. And I think it's because, as I said, most of the time people will, will identify, okay, I'm using a map concurrently, I need to lock it. But then I don't think people think the same of slices, which is wrong. And yeah, in this case, what we have is just a very simple, um, um, a very simple uh, uh, weight group, whereby um, we would uh, wait uh, for all the goal routines to have finished. And then we would expect that the slice here would have uh, the same number of uh, the same length, basically the same items as it has the capacity which we've provided. And since we are, we should be sure, of course, because we're iterating um, that it, it, we should have 2000 here and 2000 here. But actually it's not because um, at any point in time, there might be a race condition between uh, one go routine trying to append here and another one trying to append. And this, the case is that they both think that the current index, like the current, uh, the current index that they need to append from you know, the, the offset, so to speak, is the same. Um, and, and that's wrong, of course, because they will basically override each other's, um, they won't really append, they will override. So um, yeah, the solution here, of course, is to use a mutex uh, and just append. Um, yeah, and this way you get uh, the correct uh, results. Um, this is not a problem, uh, but something I want to mention, um, if uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but usually if you uh, have a, another scenario whereby you have a slice, like fixed size slice, you, you're never going to change it, and you know that you don't need a lock, you can just assign because the you know, goals memory model, I mean, you have, uh, it will guarantee still that you don't have, um, there, is, there is no race condition actually. Uh, yeah, uh, Dmitro, yeah, this is, I guess, uh, what you mentioned, exactly. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was on the previous line, yeah, basically. It, it's still not thread safe, but uh, you guarantee that uh, proper, proper value will be in the proper units. No, uh, no, it, it, it is. Yeah, it is thread safe actually. It is thread safe because the, the way the Go memory model works, I mean, the, the way um, the slice is laid out in memory, uh, there won't be any collision, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's just like, a, uh, it's not, as I said, it's not a problem, but I just wanted to uh, point it out. Um, okay, so this is a silly one, I guess, but uh, I have seen this several times. Uh, when writing tests, people, and you have concurrent code, you would, uh, and this goes back, by the way, to writing tests. Um, when you uh, have tests, you uh, some people might put a time sleep at the end because well, I say I'm executing something and then that thing is executing other stuff in concurrently and they might be executing something concurrently and so on. And then the test will work like this, but it's not deterministic. I mean, 
it might not work. It might fail in some cases, or uh, even worse. I mean, if you have some, uh, um, uh, let's say these two are mocks, right? Because uh, this is probably not the best example, but again, trying to fit something on the on the on the page. This go uh, this uh, function here is just um, for executing. Um, I mean, uh, let's say that this uh, is an actual function that you call. And then it's a struct that has dependencies. You've uh, set it up in the test and so on. And it calls these two, right? They, if you, um, uh, if the, if the time sleep happens before that, basically um, ends before they end up, you might have something like a bug lurking without you knowing because you never got to actually checking. Um, uh, whether those mocks um, worked as uh, you know, as expected. Uh, yeah, so one solution for this is to just make sure that um, when you're testing something, some mocks, make sure that at the end of the test you have you are waiting exactly for the cancellation of a context, because yeah, let's say that your function receives a context and it passes that context to to the to these two functions and so on at the end just wait and make sure that it uh, you will receive um yeah the uh, the context done um and of course by the way I, I didn't provide this here but you can still have like another uh, an additional uh, select case which would be a timeout so you still in two places you can uh, you can check whether you've timed out uh which is a lot better than just yeah just uh, ending the test so uh yeah another takeaway is don't use time sleep in your test please uh and yeah as one of the final example the final example actually is um propagating context so um yeah this is also quite easy to um to just forget about um so let's say you're uh, you have some function is doing some work. It, you're passing context because contexts are like ubiquitous in in Go code in um, code bases, and you have some task and you pass that context to the task because let's say you it it might uh, you might want to cancel it you know while it's running if it's doing some like streaming stuff whatever, but then um, let's say uh, the uh, you, you get the result and then you have publish here and then publish uh, also is like streaming some data somewhere but uh here before you return even i mean the context get, gets cancelled you might not want this context to be the uh, to get cancelled so you just need to make sure that you are aware that propagating context is great but sometimes it's not what you actually want and one solution is to create a new one or another solution is to um, yeah wrap the uh, wrap the initial one uh, in a like in a wrapper which uh, still will make it not cancelable exactly and um, yeah that's pretty much it uh, don't uh, uh, yeah my my takeaway i guess at the end uh, for you is um, that Go provides new concurrency primitives. I think they're great, but um, at the end they uh, they solve some issues, but they provide you with new tools, new ways to shoot yourself in the foot concurrently. Um, here are some references to the uh, some things that I've uh, watched or read, and this probably is the most interesting bit. Uh, and this is not a comprehensive list. I uh, I've just uh, uh, put some stuff here because uh, it might be longer uh, if I put everything. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would encourage you to read this paper. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it uh, with my talk. Do you have any questions? Sorry for taking more than 30 minutes. It's a great talk. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I believe I have opened these articles when it was published, and it's remained open for a month. As <laughs> my browser <laughs> still something is going on, maybe just the top restart or something like that. So it's really pretty hard to read, I believe. 
but it's quite interesting and there are a lot of insights. So thank you very much that you highlighted all of them. And I believe uh, I spot a couple of them in the production actually with uh, closing channel maybe and something else. So yeah, it's real actual bugs that exist as they may exist in code base for months as while you like get the panic or something like that. So it's very important to know about them and be very careful and during the review it's very easy to add because in our code base we introduce one place where we're closing the channel and in a couple of merge requests maybe without a feature introduce another place so it won't happen like you don't see this during the code review actually and you need to know the code base and it's really very weird yeah absolutely uh yeah uh i i guess my main takeaway i guess uh when i think of it now is testing but i'm usually a test nerd i like tests <laughs> um but uh, yeah i i would um, assume that a good um a good comparison would be the usage of the sync package like usually when you want to use the sync package it, uh, it this is locking and unlocking what you do do with uh, between the lock and unlock it's called the critical area. You want this to be as shorter as possible. Like if you uh, if you have a big function with a big body that does a lot of stuff, and then you are ju you just want to lock a map, you don't lock the entire function, you just lock the reading and writing of, uh, uh, for the map, right? I think the same should be done as much as possible for using concurrent code. Like if you have if you have some code that needs to be concurrent, and you can move it to a function. And as I said, this is like a pretty popular in Go. You can have a function that looks synchronous when you look at the uh, on the uh, at the signature of the function, right? But underneath, it may actually be using a lot of Go routines. So if you can move that function, like uh, move that concurrency related logic to a function, and then test it, like really thoroughly test it, make sure that it's being tested with different uh, input parameters and stuff like that uh yeah that's uh that's probably the, the most important thing that i want to share from everything hey guys uh four minutes <laughs> maybe if you have another questions to discuss <laughs> yeah, maybe your stories how you like fight in this concurrency in the production Okay, I assume that we are happy that no one have any issues concurrency or just don't use it at all. <laughs> 